Hello! In this video, I'll be drawing the sympathetic nervous system. Now, this is an area that causes lots of confusion, and I completely get that. We have weird names like grey rami communitans and post-ganglionic fibres, and that's before we even get to the sympathetic chain. Well, I'll be running through all of these structures, and hopefully explaining what the sympathetic chain is, and why we have it. We'll start our drawing here, with a superior view of a spinal nerve. If this image doesn't make any sense to you, I'd recommend looking at my previous video on spinal nerves and the somatic nervous system. For this drawing, follow exactly the same steps as before, but leave this part of the ventral ramus blank. Next, draw a semicircle next to the ramus, and this will be our sympathetic ganglion. Finally, between the ramus and the ganglion are two small branches. These branches allow the ventral ramus and ganglion to communicate with each other, and are known as the rami communicantes. We're now ready to add the sympathetic nerve fibres. For this video, I'll only be drawing the efferent sympathetic fibres, however the afferent fibres take a broadly similar route, just heading in the opposite direction. The efferent fibres start as cell bodies in the grey matter. They leave the spinal cord via the ventral route, and enter the spinal nerve, just as we saw with the somatic efferents. However, at this point, they do something different. Have you ever been on a long car journey, when someone suddenly needs a wee? so you have to leave the motorway, head down the flip road, and find the nearest services. Well, that's kind of what happens here. Our efferent fibres travelling along the ramus suddenly turn and head down this small branch toward the ganglion. Here, instead of stopping for a lubrate and an overpriced coffee, our first efferent fibre is going to sign up with a second efferent fibre. The second efferent fibres start as cell bodies here, then send fibres back to the ventral ramus via the other ramus communicants. These then travel out into the body as normal. For now, we can see two things. First, our sympathetic efferent supply consists of two groups of fibres. Fibres that pass from the spinal cord to the ganglion are preganglionic fibres. Fibres that pass from the ganglion into the body are postganglionic fibres. Preganglionic fibres are covered in myelin. This fatty sheath improves the speed of transmission and makes the nerves appear white. Because of this, we call the ramus that they travel along the white ramus communicans. Postganglionic fibres don't have myelin, making them slower and greyer. These travel back to the ventral ramus along the grey ramus communicans. The other thing we can see is a bit of a puzzle. Our efferent fibres ultimately head out via the ventral ramus, so why bother going to the ganglion? Well, it's important to remember that we don't just have a sympathetic ganglion at one level, we'll find them at every spinal level. All of these ganglia are connected to each other, forming a sympathetic chain that runs from the head to the pelvis on either side of the spine. Why is this important? Well, to answer that, we need to head to our final illustration. Here we can see a wider view of the sympathetic nervous system. If you don't fancy drawing this out, you can find a link to the image below. On the left is the brain and spinal cord, on the right are some of the organs that receive sympathetic innervation, and in the middle is the sympathetic chain. The sympathetic nervous system have effects throughout the body, from dilating our pupils to increasing our heart rate, to stimulating the release of adrenaline or slowing down digestion. Because of this widespread distribution, we need sympathetic efferents to leave at every spinal level. But when we start adding the efferents to this picture, we encounter a problem. The preganglionic fibres that pass from the spinal cord to the sympathetic chain are only found at the levels of T1 to L2. So how can we distribute these nerves throughout the body? This is where the sympathetic chain comes in. Essentially, the sympathetic chain is like an elevator that runs the length of the body. Preganglionic fibres can only enter the elevator between the levels of T1 to L2. However, once they've entered the elevator, they're free to travel to any spinal level. Once they've arrived at the right level, they can pass a message on to a postganglionic fibre that heads out into the body. This means that despite only starting in one section of the spinal cord, 
our sympathetic nerve can reach organs at every level of the body. So the preganglionic fibres will do one of three things upon entering the chain. Sometimes, as we saw in our drawing, they'll sign up with postganglionic fibres at the same spinal level. Other times they'll travel up the chain to sign up at a higher spinal level, and this is particularly important for innovating structures above the level of T1. Or they may enter the chain and travel down to sign up at a lower spinal level. And again, this is really important for reaching structures below L2. So, that's why we have this sympathetic chain. Before I look at a clinical scenario, let's recap the main points. The sympathetic efferents are divided into fast preganglionic fibres and slow postganglionic fibres. Preganglionic fibres are only found between T1 and L2. These enter the sympathetic chain and can do one of three things. Sign up at the same level, sign up at a higher level, or sign up at a lower level. Let's finish with a clinical scenario. Imagine a patient with compression of their sympathetic chain just here, above the level of T1. What symptoms would they have? Well, compression here would stop any preganglionic fibres from reaching the upper ganglia in the chain. This means that postganglionic fibres at these levels won't receive any innervation. Without this, we'll see loss of all sympathetic innervation to one side of the head. How would this prevent in the patient? We'd see constriction of one pupil, drooping of the same eyelid, and a lack of sweating on the injured side. This condition is known as Horner's syndrome. That's the end of my introduction to the sympathetic nervous system. I hope this has helped make things clearer, but if you have any questions or problems, please get in touch. If you've had a go at drawing along, please send your pictures in, I love seeing them. But other than that, take care, and I'll hopefully see you soon. Cheers.